a power player of the year. She spent the year walking over eggshells and minefields, which represent relations with President Donald Trump on the NAFTA file. So today, drum roll, please, power player and foreign affairs minister Chris Freeland is uh, off trying to stave off Armageddon over North Korea. She was a little busy today to chat about uh, this. So let's bring in, I'm pretty pleased to bring in two retired politicians, no strangers to the foreign affairs beat. Uh, former conservative minister Peter McKay is in Toronto and former liberal Foreign Affairs Minister Lloyd Axworthy comes to us from Winnipeg. And I, I guess I want to get, uh, gentlemen, what your, goes through your mind when you see Freeland trying to walk this tightrope as Trump sort of lobs these non-diplomatic grenades in their directions. That's got to compl complicate this mission impossible, doesn't it, Peter McKay? It does, and I, I actually think it's a good choice. I think she has been one of the best performers in this government, uh, very competent on trade matters, and she had that portfolio exclusively previously, and now she has a much bigger one. Um, yes, handling that file with the current president in the White House is, is certainly challenging. You see some of the divergence becoming more and more um, pronounced every day. But you'll recall, Don, that uh, Christia Freeland gave quite a, a strong, robust speech in the House of Commons laying out Canada's foreign policy, which I think uh, was well received in the United States, quite frankly, and it talked about Canada playing a more robust role internationally. Where it becomes divergent, of course, is the more progressive uh, elements that the Prime Minister himself has espoused. And, and I think that's now impacting on a lot of other trade deals, not just NAFTA. It impacted clearly in TPP, in the talks in China. And the President gave a speech yesterday as well that emphasized security. And uh, that is perhaps hearkening back to an age that we've seen where the Americans uh, believe that uh, security trumps trade. Uh, so, certainly, uh, Minister Freeland has her hands full on, on that file, amongst some of the others. And you mentioned uh, the North Korea file. That's also figuring very prominently in the U.S. agenda. Lloyd Axworthy, I'm not sure we've ever had a foreign affairs minister who's had to encounter something like a Trump administration. Uh, how has she done? I mean, has she, has she walked that tightrope properly, in your view? Well, Don, I think there's an old expression that they're shelling our regiment, and there's no question that there's a lot of lobs coming uh, from Washington, <laughs> and uh, sometimes you're not sure which direction. I think she's been able to not just duck them, but I think she's been able to return fire at times, um, not with the same kind of uh, ferocity, but I think with uh, a little bit more skill. Um, I, I think uh, the foreign minister has done very well by Canada in the last uh, three or four months. I think she's had heavy lifting to do, but has not uh, sort of looked in any way uh, panicky or out of place. I think it was a very, she's been very calm and very cool about it. And at the same time, you know, she's got a very large foreign affairs security portfolio. Uh, NAFTA has dominated headlines, but uh, as we're seeing now, uh, the nuclear issue, both in Iran and in North Korea, are really coming to the forefront. And that's going to take uh, some very careful and skillful understanding of uh, the new, we're almost in a new nuclear age now. Uh, they're revising their weapons, modernizing their systems. Uh, and I think people are getting scared that uh, some of the old commitments on disarmament and uh, of reduction and non-proliferation no longer have the cachet. Uh, so we, the Russians don't buy it, Chinese don't buy it, the Americans don't buy it. So you've got very big powers uh, throwing their weight around, and then you've got some uh, teeny powers like North Korea, you know, uh, wanna, wannabes, uh, they want to be part of the gang. So uh, Canada's got to play a very uh, skillful, I wouldn't say it's a tightrope as much as it is a real navigation job, zigzagging between uh, these different kinds of uh, risks that they have. Zigzagging is right. Now, Peter McKay, you had to deal with the last Republican administration in the foreign affairs capacity. It wasn't quite as dramatic as the Trump one. I'm curious, is, is there any advice you'd give Freeland, particularly on the trade file? Because that's the one that I think a lot of Canadians are watching with considerable alarm, because it certainly seems to be going down in flames. What do you think? Well, I, I think, uh, you know, Mr. Axworthy is correct in, in pointing out that uh, Mr. Freeland's been very deft in, in handling a lot of different subject matters uh, in, during a very intense time. Uh, my counterpart in foreign affairs was uh, Condoleezza Rice 
And so having a good working relationship, and I think you're seeing that uh, demonstrated today with Rex Tillerson coming to Ottawa. Uh, and I think that, you know, not to, not to suggest that there's a wedge of any sort between uh, Ms. Freeland and, and uh, the Prime Minister, but she has much less trust, let's say, of communist regimes. Uh, she is mm -hmm. certainly very weary, very leery, I should say, <laughs> of, uh, of the Russians. And uh, I think mm -hmm. she also has a very informed view as a former journalist and having spent perhaps a great deal of time outside the country prior to her entry into politics. So she is, uh, she's informed, she's hardworking. I know she spends a great deal of time immersing herself in the files. And um, as was pointed out, I, I think she demonstrates a great deal of competence and confidence when dealing with foreign countries. Yeah, Peter McKay, that's high praise coming from you. Everyone forgets you're sometimes a conservative and, and progressive conservative one initially. But uh, I do want to get your thoughts, Lloyd Axworthy, on uh, whether the best or the worst is yet to come, the heavy lifting is yet to come, because NAFTA is wobbling, as you, as you know, and Donald Trump sort of unleashed this national security vision from putting the world on notice about it. Do you think, think her heavy lifting has just begun? Uh, Don, I think what uh, we see signs of already is that uh, they're preparing for alternatives. I, I think clearly we, the trade relationship with the United States is very key to Canada. But uh, at the same time, there's been a real opening up with other... We've had a new uh, trade agreement with Europe. Uh, they're talking about China. They're talking about countries in Asia. Uh, there's going to be a big summit of the Americas held uh, this coming June. Uh, I think that we've got a number of cards to play uh, and that uh, we shouldn't be uh, totally obsessed or focused just on NAFTA. It may be that at some point uh, there's going to be an agreement. You can't live on the same piece of rock uh, and not have an agreement, especially when you've got the heavy traffic and the integrated industries. Whatever Mr. Trump says, he's not going to be able to change that. But the reality is I think we need to uh, diversify our trade and our security relationships. There's a lot going on in the world that the, the Trump administration is simply not dealing with. And I can tell you this, Don, just quickly, a trip I just had to uh, Eastern Europe, the Balkans, recently. Uh, many of them are looking to Canada as opposed to the Americans because they see some consistency, they see some openness, and they see some, uh, some skill. And they don't see that right now with the American administration. Peter McKay, do you think that's possible that Canada really could be a mediator or a bridge between the North Koreans and the Americans somehow? It seems like a very large canyon, and I don't know how we bridge that. I, I don't believe so, but I guess it's, it's worth a try, and uh, it does involve other parties that clearly have an interest in the region. Um, you know, to come back to recent events, the Prime Minister not showing up for that final meeting at the TPP and coming back right. empty-handed from China... I think uh, is perhaps more reflective of, of the influence, but nevertheless, it's, it's worth trying. And because the Americans, of course, have very strong interests in this, uh, it shows goodwill and effort on our part. Uh, I am concerned about, coming back to NAFTA, the thickening of the border. And where Minister Freeland does have strengths is to talk about the importance of security. Uh, she gave a very, you know, impassioned speech about that. And, you know, the Americans are... They're, they're tacking in a much different direction than us in terms of progressive values versus their inward-looking protectionist uh, plans. The president himself, I think, is, is hearkening back to an age, and I, I believe uh, Mr. Axworthy can correct me here, but Henry Kissinger talked about America during a certain time having uh, not uh, strong friends or perhaps not permanent friends and enemies, only interests. And I think that we're seeing very much that mentality, that sentiment being expressed almost daily from the White House. So Christy Freeland has to talk a lot about security, has to talk about the necessity of keeping this trade in place, this trade relationship that has endured. And uh, that's going to involve a, a great deal of skill. In some cases, talking to a different generation, uh, Rex Tillerson, Wilbur Ross, they're coming from a different generation and clearly taking their marching orders directly from the president. Yeah, that's the problem. Lloyd asked for that. How difficult is it to talk about this summit about North Korea when Rex Tillerson may have a problem of not having the full confidence right. of this president? Isn't that going to be a, a waste of time if he, if he gets replaced by someone that doesn't want to continue this process? You know, I, I, in some ways, you really have to have sympathy for Rex Tillerson. I mean, the one thing that's essential uh, 
in a cabinet is that you've got to have confidence in each other, especially between a foreign minister and the prime minister or president. I mean, you, you're working on so many files together. You've got uh, so many other people outside looking at what you're saying and kind of pouring them over like tea leaves. And if you've got this kind of distance and gap, it really undermines your credibility. Uh, I'm glad that he's here. I really think that the, the meeting that's being held uh, in a month's time in January is an important one because what it's doing is something is taking it outside the UN. Uh, a lot of the times, these negotiations in the Security Council you know, is like a minuet. You just go through the same steps. Taking it outside, you may get some serious discussion. And in the past, there have been programs for North Korea that came together by several other countries, both on humanitarian issues, of food and grain, as well as security issues. And the key, the key player here is China. What's the, does anybody have any le leverage with the Chinese at the present time? Well, let's find out. Uh, so I think that meeting is a very important one, and that's where I think Canada can come up with some proposals. And that's not based just on a something that's uh, euphoric. I mean, that's something we've been doing now for 20, 30 years. We've had contacts in North, North Korea, diplomatic ones as well. It's time that we build on those, but we also have to refresh them. All right. Peter McKay, quick thought from you, if I could, before I break. Uh, I want to ask you about Tillerson and how, how would you deal with a guy that looks like he's on his last legs as the Secretary of State? Doesn't that be able to pose a real problem for a foreign affairs minister in Canada? Well, I, I think you have to ignore some of the clatter around this and deal with the issues that are in front of you. I, I don't think uh, right. the daily rumor mill coming out of the White House and, and the morality play that seems to be going on there every other day uh, should impact on these important issues that we're discussing here, whether it's North Korea, whether it's trade. Uh, the CETA issue in terms of our diversity of trade is, is something outside of these discussions that are taking place in Ottawa that I think the government has to be a little more aggressive on and, and move away from some of the partisan rhetoric about Canada's back and, and really key in on, on trying to move these trade issues forward, capitalize on the opportunity that lays for us in... in uh, Europe with that 28 member or 27 member, um, you know, trillions of dollars of, uh, uh, of business opportunities, uh, hundreds of millions of people there that are hungry for Canadian blueberries and fish products and other uh, areas where the Canadian economy could really gain uh, by having a more active presence there. We've got a lot of people uh, throughout the Department of Foreign Affairs at our, our embassies and councils across the, the European continent that are keen to play up that issue of CETA and trade with Canada. That, that also leads to issues right. around Brexit and where Canada could pursue a free trade agreement with the United Kingdom. All right. That's an interesting panel. You two guys should get together more often and talk like this. It was great having you both. <laughs>